everybody, welcome to Guitars OK. I'm your host, Mac, and today is a special episode with a friend of mine. Uh, I have Chad from Sine Wave Amps, but before we turn it over to him, uh, I just want to say thanks for tuning in, and uh, make sure you subscribe and ring the bell. Um, really appreciate it, and helps with the algorithm in YouTube to push out the episode. So, uh, Chad, welcome to the show, man. How you doing, brother? Pretty good, Mac. Thanks for having me on. It's good yeah. to uh, chat with you again. Yeah, brother, why don't you explain to all the viewers, okay, like what you do for a living, man, and where they can find you. All right. Uh, I started Sine Wave Amplifiers in 2015. I had previous, you know, 30 years of experience building amps and speaker cabinets. But uh, right now, if you go to SineWaveAmps.com or SineWaveAmp on Instagram, which is going to have more of up-to-date stuff, um, I build custom amp guitar amplifiers been doing it for a long time i i kind of got rid of the production grind and got down to just a, a one-man shop and wanted to just build one-on-one -on -one amps with uh each guy or gal yeah um, so yeah you know i have models and kind of based on those models things evolve and change depending on what kind of amp it is that the player needs um Anything from like Fender based stuff to Dumble stuff, Marshalls, Vox, uh, any of that kind of material. I kind of, I take all those ingredients and, and and build something that works. All right. Now, um, Chad, we have a mutual friend, right? So uh, Brandon Autry. <laughs> Is, yeah, you, you made an amp for Brandon. So some of the other viewers might have saw the prior episode where Brandon was playing with Paul Benjamin here in the Tulsa Sound at the Colony, which is where Clapton and George Harrison and all them guys used to hang out in Tulsa back Very in the seventies. Cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So your amp was sitting right in there, and I was listening to him, and he's digging in and getting these good sounds over the band and punching through. And I was like, I, I had to ask him, like, where'd you get this amp? Like, come on. So that's how it all started. So shout out to Brandon Autry. So <laughs> awesome dude, awesome player. Yeah, yeah so, no, Brandon knew uh, me from uh, my days when I was head of production and engineering at Two Rock Amplifiers. And when I launched this and left that company, uh, he hit me up and he wanted something a little different that he couldn't find. I think he'd gone through, like, I think he had a match list or maybe a bad cat you know he wanted more gain on tap like right out of the get-go he didn't want a clean amp but he didn't want it to compress and get squishy right out of the gate so we kind of went back and forth and finally i said you know what let me i've got some ideas i had recently been messing around with kind of hybrid I don't want to say Marshall, but kind of like a Marshall and a Fender where you've got gain stages that feed the EQ um, and then gain stages after the EQ, um, like orange amps, but they kind of incorporate something like that. But, you know, I didn't want that level of gain. So I came up with a new circuit and, you know, went back and forth with Brandon until we got that amp that he's got, which was a very cool prototype amp. You know, you, you dial in the gain at the front of the amp and that's pri before the, the EQ. Um, and then after the EQ, there's another gain stage. And then after that gain stage, then there's a master volume, which then feeds the phase inverter. So then there's another gain stage. So there's all this variability in like how he wants to dial it in. Because sometimes he was telling me he wants to be able to use a strap and just get a little bit of edge of breakup or act like a black face. But then he plays his Les Paul a lot. And uh, he wanted it to, like I said, kind of grind a little bit. And having that pre-gain EQ was cool because it starts pushing the mids. And it was, you know, I figured it out and dialed it in until it wouldn't get all compressed. And that's yeah, cool amp. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So do you have standard amps you kind of start with? Um, you know, or do you, or is everything from the bottom up custom, or do you kind of have certain models you kind of start with and then build on those? When I start the conversations with guys, I usually start to go like, you know, okay, what are you using? And as you know, guitar, we're, we're pretty easy. And we also have a very 
long history of, you know, is, is it a Marshall? Is it a Fender? Is it a Vox? And all of our guitar stuff is based on those designs in one way or another and what we like to hear, what we play. So usually the, you know, the conversations start with, you know, what are you using? You know, are you a Fender guy? Are you a Marshall guy? Um, who do you like listening to? And given that realm, I don't have like specific things I'll say like, oh, just buy this amp. I mean, some guys will hit me up and they just want a, a you know, my clean amp. And I go, cool, the continuum is here for you. It's a fender based platform. Um, but, you know, you get a guy like Brandon and it's like, he doesn't necessarily want a fender and you kind of start looking back at the other amps that he's used and go, okay, let's build this from the ground up. But with that said, there's only so many ways to skin a, a tube amp, you know? So that amp that he's got, you know, you could say it's fender based because it, it has a fender style tone stack and a fender style phase inverter. Um, you know, whereas like a, a, you know, if he hit me up and was like, I'm a Marshall player and I want that thing, that has a cathode follower that feeds the EQ and a gain stage before it. Um, and so, like I said, I kind of took that Marshall type ideology, but made it blackface. Nice. You've got a good background in all this. So let's uh, back up for a second and, and share with all the listeners how you ended up cutting your teeth. So you're from the California area, I know from a prior conversation with you. So let's just kind of start with where you grew up. Was it a music household? You know, what got you into guitar, music, and amps? Um, not necessarily a music household. I mean, my, my grandfather played drums for ever and did his thing. Um, I grew up with, you know, hopefully like every household, a lot of music being played. You know, there was Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd records playing constantly or anything along those lines. Um, I got into playing guitar in my teens due to a, um, an injury. I couldn't play sports. And my mom went, this ain't going to fly. Here's a guitar. Here's lessons. You're going to do something. And that kind of started that process. And as I went through high school, I... I didn't really think anything about it. You know, I had just normal jobs. And um, once I got into college, I was doing the music classes and the music side of the school at college, but I was also doing other things. And I was just like, I want to dive more into this. So I started trying to get a job at the local music store. And they're just like, dude, we don't have space. We don't have space. And I kept coming back. And this would have been about 95. And at that time, Mojo Musical Supply was a local company here in Petaluma and had been open, I don't know, maybe two years-ish, maybe a little bit more. I don't really recall how long they'd been open. And their cabinet shop was just getting started. And my buddies down at the music store were like, hey, dude, go talk to this guy, Paul. He, he's doing the, the cabinets. They're doing, you know, Marshall repros fender stuff guys were calling up and saying hey i need like a princeton cab or back panels so paul was in this warehouse just building stuff and i went down and i had i come from a construction family so i knew how to use table saws skill saws woodworking stuff and so he hired me and so i spent the next i don't know three years i guess you know building cabinets and kind of diving into that whole realm i mean mesa boogie was around the corner voodoo uh pedals was right next door at the time uh there was tons of luthiers around so i mean it was a really cool environment uh just constant music guys and stuff so who did you mean, see hell, did you see some big guys come walking through at that time you know what i mean just... we were building cabinets for like metallica and doing stage rigs for lenny kravitz and i mean anybody that needed stuff and was going to shows i mean people were coming in i mean at one point and at the time i didn't realize it um this dude shows up in the shop and paul's like oh, he's some big time amp builder and i'm like okay cool and you know, later on, I realized 
holy shit, that was Alexander Dumble. And I just spent like the last two or three weeks, you know, just hanging out with this dude, not even having a clue who he was. You know, now I'm going, oh, if I could have only asked him more <laughs> questions. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. But yeah, there was a lot of that stuff going on. And I did that for numerous years. And as I got more into it, um, I remember going over to Voodoo at one point and going, hey, this is pretty cool. You know, do you have like part-time side job? And they're like, we're full. No, no, no. And then um, Paul, he also built cabinets on the side for a couple local music amp companies. Like they were doing like Buddha amplifiers and uh, Two Rock. And there was a handful of other guys that had just started companies. And this would have been in 99. And he left the country and was like, hey, I need you to build cabinets for Two Rock amplifiers. And at the time, I think they'd been in business for like maybe six months. And so... I spent a couple months building cabinets for them, head shells, speaker cabinets. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, oh, this is pretty cool. And so I was like, I want a job. And they kept going, nah, nah, nah. And I'm like, oh, no, I want a job. And finally, uh, Bill, the owner, co-owner with Joe, uh, Bill Cronard, Joe Malaganowski, they, Bill's like, okay, hey, here, if you can, you know, take this amp, take it apart, put it back together, I'll hire you. And I went, okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, colored pens and co colored pencils later, uh, I got the amp back together. And, you know, knock on wood, it, it worked. And I got hired, you know. The next several amps did not work. <laughs> I love it. That's I funny. actually, I, I have the original the second amp I ever built over there in the corner. And, uh, so I, I did the two rock thing up until 2015 and became Bill's right hand man with engineering and design work. I was head of production. I taught everybody how to build amps. I mean, I was, that was my thing. At one point I split off and I uh, opened up a cabinet shop. So I was working at two rock and right next door, there was a huge bay opened up and I opened up a full woodworking shop and started building cabinets funny enough for buddha again i ended up also starting i built their amplifiers for like two years before they got bought by pv uh worked with a bunch of guys with that um and then two rock got bought by premier builders guild and that you know at that time i was like kind of getting over the cabinet thing i wanted to get back to building amps and so i went back and just full time under Premier Builders Guild and Two Rock, and I did that till 2015, and just was a little disillusioned. I it was getting a lot larger of a company, more of a production line. I mean, still great quality, great products, but just I wasn't into it. I missed just sitting at a bench and building amps. Here's my question for you. Who did you uh, make some amps for back then? Did you deal with some guys? Oh, no. So I know, like, what I are mean, some... with, like, of course, the big one was John Mayer. I mean, he really launched Two Rock in a different direction. I mean, but we were building amps for everybody. I mean, you know, Robin Ford, uh, Steve Kimmock, uh, Warren Haynes. Uh, I mean, just dudes wow. just everybody was coming through and like getting amps um you know as things progressed i mean i was taking amps down to shoreline and places in san francisco and meeting with just players and it was really really cool because a lot of guys were coming into the shop and it was a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with bill and really just focusing on all these great players and all these great amplifiers that they had and really fine tuning and nitpicking how the amps work, all the little small tweaks, you know, what was really important in a guitar amplifier. Um, which again, kind of led to the later decision to come back and do this myself. Cause a lot of those fine tweaks and stuff, are really individually based on the amp. I mean, you could build an amp A, B, C, D every day, 
pull the same parts, build the amp, kick it out. It looks exactly the same. And they never sound the same. They never feel this. There's just such small little tweaky things that happen in these devices that you got to, you got to fine tune. See, that's an interesting point because it's like a domino effect kind of thing. You know, my dad was a diesel mechanic and we had a shop and everything. So I used to see him work on stuff, you know, and, and there's certain areas of every vehicle where if you're talking transmission and emissions, there's always like these little tiny things that if something's out of whack or, or if you just want to change something, if you want to change gearing or RPM or transmission or whatever, you write ratios. And so it seems like guitar building or amp building, I'm sorry, is similar to that. Like you can tweak something here and you get a different result. Tweak something down here, you might get a, lead you down a different path. So I bet you you're pretty good at figuring things out and maybe maybe even do you do a lot of reverse engineering then it sounds like you're hearing what people like kind of built starting backwards then yeah i mean after you've built over a thousand amps oh you know and for almost 30 years and people go like oh it's too compressed oh okay i you know you go change this thing or you just you start to get the lingo which as you know guitar guitarist lingo is really quite funny I mean, if my <laughs> wife, when she first met me, would hear me and she's like, what the hell are you talking about? I'm like, well, honey, it's it's buttery goodness with, you know, ice picky highs, but it, it just slides right in. And she's going, I have no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> it's bubbly. It's round. It's, bubbly, it's flat. Yeah. It's there's, <laughs> there's a little like there's woody overtones on it. And <laughs> you start to hear this in, the, you know, kind of what you're talking about, you know, change this little thing here and it'll accomplish this. But there's also like a domino effect of if I change this and it affects this, oh, now the amp's got too much gain or it's got too much presence. So maybe we need to attenuate it a little bit more down there, which then you got to tweak something else. And it is this kind of fine dance of Hmm, how do you get there? It's a lot of fun, though. Now, what I hear you saying, too, is you ha you probably have to be able, to, just like a sessions musician, to, to throw your pride out there because you're running with it. You're like, I can do this, I can do it. But then you get to a certain point, you think you got it, and you got to reel it back in because now they want you to go backwards a little bit and change something. And so kind of like Tim Pierce and them, it sounds like similar, like them, you know, them sessions, these guys, Tom Bukovac, all them, where they're like in a session and they're like, they're making something. It sounds great, but wait, wait, let's go back. Let's change it now. You know, and you know, a lot of, it seems like there's a lot of temperaments out there that might not be able to handle that kind of situation. So you seem to be the type of guy that's able to, you know what I mean? You're confident, you're pushing forward, but maybe you got to go back and redo something now. So talk about that for a minute, how these guys adjust things and, you know, how you got to kind of Most fix things. Of the time, I mean, you know, knock on wood, I've not had any amps really come back past the initial consultation stage that needed massive changes, unless they went with something and went, this isn't what I needed. And then it's like, okay, well then let's go to, you know, this other thing. Um, it is, I have, I guess, how do I say this? The pride thing you're talking about, I have no problem going like, all right, that sucks. That doesn't work for you. Cool. See, well, there let's, it is. let's figure it out. <laughs> and I mean, I like the challenge of them sitting there and going, it's too compressed. And it's like, oh, okay, let's change this um piece i mean i've got one uh, i shouldn't say kid but asher who was local he's down at ucla he's a great kid i mean a phenomenal player and asher belsky he had me build him an amp and he initially was like i wanted to do this and i went okay and i built it for him and he got it and he played it and he came back and went that's not what I needed. I'm like, I kind of told you that, but you need to figure that out yourself. So then I rebuilt the amp for him. And the one thing I have to say with the current setup I have now that I, I missed that I had at the old company was 
the constant influx of people and musicians coming in and that one-on-one -on -one, like bouncing stuff back and forth and it's been really fun with him um for being such a young dude he's got a really discerning ear and he'll come in and he was up for school just recently and he brought his amp and he's like hey let's fine tune it and he had a but another buddy of his that guitar player from the ucla program i mean these dudes are both monster players and we're sitting there just talking the talk and this other guitar player is going like what are you guys talking about and it's just it's so great to go oh it's it's a little too compressed all right let's let's just adjust it and kind of having this teaching moment with him or with any musician that comes in and you know putting stuff on switches and going okay play now now do you hear this and they go oh go back and we go back and then we go back and it's like this kind of dance and you go which one do you like better and then a lot of times too is once you get done with those things and once you start dealing with you know the the caliber of musicians that you want to get your stuff into the hands of they'll get it out onto stage and start to realize like oh you know what it's i need a little bit more of this and I like that stuff. It's like, oh, okay, cool, bring it back. Because then at the end of the day, I mean, all it's doing is, you know, leveling me up and going, oh, okay, let's just fine tune that. Because if you just follow the connect the dots and build an amp and kick it out the door, you're, ne you're never going to learn and, and continue, continue to evolve as a, a builder. See, and I find this all interesting because, see, right there, you have that personality, which I, I got to tell you, man, I don't know if a lot of guys can do that. You know what I mean? They'll have an idea, and then they'll fight you on that. that's right. I've been in a lot of machine shops and sales and tractor and agriculture industry. I've been through a lot. You know what I mean? And it's funny because a lot of people will just push that time in, put it all in, and then push that idea and be like, well, this is just what I've got. you got to make it work. You know, They take it personal. Well, you're, you're, yeah. You've got this great personality where you're like, you're not taking it personal through these steps. The only thing you're taking personal is the overall project trying to get to a certain point and make it a great product for that person to be able to use because that's, at the end of the day, these are being used, right? That's what They're you want. They're tools. Yeah. At the end of the day, you know what, like, I just want you to be able to go make music and be creative. And I don't want you to fight your tools because right. if you have to go in and fight your amp constantly, dude, it's just going to drag you down and then you're not going to be creative. And I don't, I don't want that. I mean, I, I want it to be an awesome product that you can just plug in and, you know, get to where you need it to be and then go and then not think about it and then just want to play. Exactly. So that's that's a very interesting perspective because obviously you, you've got to get paid. You know, you're putting time in. You've got skills. You've got ideas. You, you know, you're going back and forth. You're doing a lot with people, and we under we all understand that. You know, and we know that the price of amps and custom amps can be high, but what you're saying is really important because the player to the player, it's got to be worth all that in order to just get out there and be creative and do their thing, like you said. So I, I really give you kudos and thumbs up on that because it, you're making it sound easy, but I know for a fact it's just not. I mean, even trying to build cars for people, race cars and all that kind of stuff, it's it can be a process and it can be hard. So a lot of people just default back to, this is what I made, go use it, you know? And it seems right. like, let's talk about this for a minute. If somebody reaches out to you and they want a guitar amp, we. Uh, you know, you were talking about working with them, the sounds, right, what they play, what they like. And then you're also saying, though, that sometimes just once in a while here and there, somebody might have to bring it back. Is that still part of the initial cost or is that like more cost for them if you're going to tweak it or do you work something out kind of custom? It, you know, so most of the stuff before I even build an amp, I really like to have consultations. And it really comes down to that because I'm definitely not a just walk into the store and I'll take a kind of guy. I mean, I have a B and C and, you know, I have you kind of have to have models. But part of if you're going to come in and buy a continuum and it's four thousand bucks. We're going to talk about it prior to that, because I want to know how you're going to use that amp. I want to make sure that I'm going to build the power supply in the correct wattage that's going to work for what you need it to do. 
I also want to have the discussions with you that depending on where you're at as a player, one amp is not going to fulfill ultimately everything you need at the end of the day. You might be able to get a clean amp and have pedal boards and do all that stuff and cover 90% of the stuff, but eventually you're going to go like, I want a Tweed or I want a Marshall or a Vox. And all of those things do different, just uh, they're different tools. So in that, you know, $4,000 for a continuum, you're getting all this initial conversation, you get the amp, and then, I mean, if anything ever goes wrong with the amp, depending on what it is, I mean, again, I've had a reverb driver die in 10 years. Which, now, tubes, I don't, I mean, that's just, <laughs> tubes are tubes. It's like changing oil, you know, you if you buy the car, the dealership's not changing your oil for you. And But if stuff needs to get changed in anything like that, or if it's a voicing thing, or if a guy hits it up and goes like, hey, I need more mid-range stuff like that, I'm like, look, it, you cover the cost of shipping, I'll cover the cost of everything else. So I don't charge for my time up and past that. But you do need to get the amp to me and back. That makes sense. Um, I mean, that's a good little hybrid plan right there. You're working with the customer, and I like what I'm hearing. I mean, this is really cool, man. People talk about big box stores, you know, against mom and pop, and what you're talking about is bringing back that flavor, you know, that you're just putting the – you're proactive. You're putting the time in up front. You've got a lot of experience in order to cut them off at the pass, right? And you know yeah. kind of where you're headed and all that kind of good stuff. And you are willing to work with people if there is some type of – real issue right you know but there are uh maintenance costs and amps as we all know just like brakes and oil like you said and yeah. tires you know in the car you know, nobody's gonna cover all that now let me ask you about uh do you see any different trends happening in the last few years of certain types of amp qualities that people are looking for compared to maybe 20 years ago you know not really i mean I think, you know, coming out of the 90s, as a as a, a teenager in the 90s and as a musician in the 90s, and, you know, starting with having PVs and Marshalls and, and Mesas, it seems like probably the only trend I've really seen is that people have moved more towards the multiple tool aspect of amplifiers where if I want a high gain amp, I'm going to buy a high gain amp. If I want a clean amp, you know, guys are buying fenders or that section that I, I feel like people are more interested or maybe educated in the fact that they don't need 20 guitars but they could definitely use 10 amps and whereas before it seemed like there's my amp there's my cab and now here's all my other stuff and i think you know part of even what i've done and everything else is education of the amps more important than the guitar the speaker cabinet's more important than most people even want to give it credit for. And the amp speaker cabinet as a, a unit is the most important part past these things. And I think probably the biggest trend, you know, in the 90s, we got a lot of flack for, as a boutique company, tr charging, you know, three four five thousand or up for an amplifier people were just like you're that's that's insane amounts of money and you know it's funny now and even through COVID and everything else the cost of vintage amps as we've talked about is equal to what a brand new amp boutique amp is and Again, kind of you're talking trends. I think people get to that. I'm an initial. I'm a guitar player. I bought my my Yamaha combo at Costco. They play that, and then they go. I need something better, and then they go to GC or Sweetwater or somewhere else, and they spend 
fifteen hundred bucks, yeah, thousand bucks, eighteen hundred bucks, yeah, something maybe it's somewhere somewhere in that range, and mm-hmm. that takes them so far, and you know it's funny because you used to look back and even prior to COVID, that eighteen to twenty five hundred dollar range was pretty much like the high end of the market, and it's interesting now I look at like you know Mesa Boogie uh, for example you know. And I, I know the guys there. I, I'm friends with some of the dudes. You know, their cost of goods is equivalent almost to what my cost of goods is. And if you look at like a California tweet or some of it, they're four thousand dollars. Which, again, now I think you know, trend wise, people are going like, "That's oh, that's what it costs." You know, a, a good guitar amplifier isn't going to cost you nine hundred dollars. <laughs> I mean. Before I even touch an amplifier, and granted, I'm small quantities, but my numbers aren't that far off from Mace. I've got $1,200 in parts before I even touch the thing. And, you know, $4,000 for 40 plus hours of work, you know, it's not like it's, it's crazy. It, this isn't a, uh, I'm going to get rich scheme. <laughs> There you go. Now talk about some of the equipment that you're using. What type of speakers do you like using and that kind of stuff? Uh, is there a certain brand you're using all the time or depend on the customer? Well, so as just a player and also having a long history of dis- not just building, you know, speaker designing speaker cabinets, uh, designing speakers and working with everybody from like Eminence, WGS and Celestion, speakers are very subjective. And they're very subjective to the cabinet you're using, the room you're using, the amp you're using, and at the end of the day, the player. And I have speakers I like, and I have speakers I don't like. And it also comes down to the expectations of what you're trying to get out of, again, that tool. Um, For the speaker cabinets I have in the shop, or I should say like my main test cabinet that I basically play everything through. Um, I use Celestion G12 K100s and they're funny enough. I mean, if you look at Celestion's website, they were designed and built for heavy metal, (laughs) which is the complete opposite of almost everything I do. I mean, I built, I built some high gain amps, but for the most part, that's not my, my man thing and but they're very they're they're not flat like an ev would be but they're high powered enough that they're flat enough and the biggest thing for me is low end handling is the speaker isn't going to flub out or give up on the low end it's going to stay punchy oh, it's a little windy here yeah and uh so that's like my go-to speaker but Mm -hmm. you know with that said it's like if i was going to build like say you a a little combo amp right alnico's are really way more musical than a a, a ceramic speaker is but they give up on the low end but if you're kind of going for a vintage kind of hashy low gain you know 15 watt thing dude a good alnico is gonna sound great Maybe you like, you know, there's a bunch of uh, boutique speakers out there. Some of them sound amazing. I've had some in the shop where I've been like, God, these are garbage, but the customer absolutely loves them. So (laughs) I love it. It's kind of an argument around town here, even in T-Town. It's also, you know, the warehouse, the warehouse speakers are used a lot around here now instead of other ones. And I've got Jensen's in that, you know, Tone Master, which I use for more recording, talking to you about one I would be able to play out with more, you know. And uh, but that's another thing. A lot of these, you know, twelve hundred, sixteen hundred dollar ones now have the versatility of XLRs out and makes it a little easier for all this kind of stuff, you know. Right. But, But at the end of the day, if you are playing out somewhere, I don't know about you, I like. You know, I like to have more of a mic kind of amp thing, you know. Well, so, you, you yeah. know, we need that air movement. Yes. And there's also an interaction that, you know, as the speaker waves come off the front of the speaker 
and if it's an open back or whatever and they're bouncing off they're also interacting with your spring your strings there's feedback mechanisms that happen there that are really important in like second harmonic just acoustical harmonics um no, you're right because there is that harmonic resonance thing that happens with strings and even like playing, man. I've always like, I think it's funny on that pedal show, they have experience days where guys can come out. And if you ever watch that pedal show, right? Yep. With oh, yeah. Guys, yeah, of course, right? And they have the experience days where guys come out and they're always talking about it. They don't record them, but they talk about what happened after. It's always like playing loud, you know, that 100 decibel but with high headroom, nice and clear. So it's like loud, but it's very beautiful. And there's that trying, just hitting the strings. The magic and, happens. Oh, yeah, man. All the, the pull-offs, hammers, you're sliding up. You're, you know what I mean? Just everything kind of just it gives me goosebumps just talking about it. You yeah. know? But, but we grew up more in the MTV era. I'm older than you a little bit. but And so for me, I, I you know went to concerts. You see Eddie Van Halen and Neil Sean and all these Loud. guys. Yeah, and Def Leppard <laughs> and, you know, and The Cult. And, you know, it's just like, you know, like nobody, you know, back then there really wasn't what we have now i've even got an hx stomp that i use over there for like my church scenarios and stuff you know but sometimes i run it for the effects with the reverbs and delays and ambient stuff and then i just run it through an amp like a right. pedal you know what i mean so i can even use it that way but it is interesting so much nowadays where people are complaining about noise levels and on stage and then there's even like the rumors of the of the uh, fake amps on stage for some of the big bands right i built a lot of those cabinets Really? No kidding. I built a lot of empty <laughs> two by twelves. No way. And head shells that just had panels and knobs and lights. <laughs> and lights. I built a lot of them. Oh my gosh, that's funny. Because <laughs> we kind of expect it. Well, I, I, I you, probably the, the the coolest looking ones is going back. We built a huge stage rig for Lenny Kravitz. And they were a Marshall style. It was all Marshall, but that white Marshall with gold piping. And I want to say we built one, two. I think we built like 10 full stacks <laughs> and heads that went on top that just had a nine volt battery for the L, the light bulb. And that was his stage rig. That's hilarious. You know, and, but then it went into an amp, out the amp, into another set of amps that you couldn't even see. But it looked cool, you know. <laughs> Gives you that feeling that you're in the audience. You're like, yeah, man, he's killing it. <laughs> yeah. And then you see guys like Joey Landreth, who's, you know, as we know, is using the two rock stuff now. And yep. he's got them them signature. That's why I was asking you about some trends, because not only are like XLR out and all that stuff a trend lately, but I don't know if that's actually a trend anymore, if it's more of just a thing that you can offer for some of these brands. But really the trend, um, I know if, kind of is the reverb the dual the combos and all the reverb stuff you know what i mean compared to just plugging into an amp anymore you know and just playing loud like marshall's and stuff years ago you know and, and all that but i know joey lander's got that what is you you know more about it um what's what's the bait would that come from the i would know bloomfield came off the bloomfield design from the two rock uh, so there's the bloomfield right the Bloomfield, I think, is just like a tweedish based front end. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm. Yeah, you've been well, out of it I, for a little bit, but. I've been out of that for a while. And, yeah. you know, Bill, who develops all those amps, we talk all the time, but we talk about weird crap. Right. Yeah, of course. We, we talk about <laughs> weird amps that, and circuits that are just <laughs> off the wall, or what if we do this that. Most yeah. of it will never see the light of day, but it's fun to talk about. Yeah. But I think that amp's like a tweed style amp. And it's pretty nice. Some of these, the, the, the Joey Landreth one, I mean, they sell like hotcakes. I don't know if you listen to Joey I at all. The, the Landreth, I, I think stuff. it's more, looking at the specs, it's almost like a Showman reverb. Oh, interesting. That would make sense, that, actually. That would make it's sense. It's got, like, I know it's got the harmonic trem like a magnetone it's not trem it's vibrato which is i, th I think almost probably the exact circuit that was in the showman's hey um, real quick what's the difference between vibrato and tremolo tremolo so tremolo. trem is, yeah. just, is just actually amplitude Vol you know volume just on off on off on off 
where vibrato is actually sh pitch shifting the signal wave. Um, and you know, there's magnetones got probably the greatest vibrato ever. One of my favorite amps in my shops and actually a vibrato uh, magnetone organ amp from like, I want to say like 62. That's it's, cool. It's so lush. That's it's, what one of the guys in town, Paul Benjamin, he's like our Tulsa sound guy, you know, the Tulsa sound thing from the yeah, 70s is still going on now. And the, and the guy around town, Paul Benjamin, and he's a lot of times he's playing, he's either using super reverbs, classic ones, tube ones, or he's using the magnetone. And depending on where he's at, like in a little cocktail bar thing, I go see him. Play. Yeah, yeah. He got that magnetone kind of in the corner. Oh, dude, it's so like the one I've got. It's such a cool cabinet because it was for an organ, so it has two Alnico speakers that point outward. Okay. And so it, what it does, and it's a stereo amp, so it it will go like in vibrato. It'll do this. <laughs> the pulsate. Pulsate, you know, they were trying to like emulate, you know, like a Leslie back in the day, or you can do a chorus and it's just so I'm like, oh God, that's so cool. I mean, I built a couple showman style vibrato amps for two rock. God, this Bill and I, I think we did it like around 2010 or something like that. And it was just such a complicated amp that they're like, eh, not really worth making too many of them <laughs> not too many of them and because i mean it's a complicated circuit to do with tubes it's yeah. cool though it's yeah it's, man there's i showed you a picture of my friend seth right he's getting ready to finish up that he got that cabinet thing with the revolving spinning yeah, yeah. so that we'll see what happens when he's done making that i'll send you some videos on that so it's a plug, little plug for seth lee jones luthier uh, guitar extraordinaire in town it's just amazing opened up for robert cray recently and uh, you know they were loving them and, and stuff so uh kind of a good little little plug for my buddy here but he builds yeah. guitars and like i said before with you he got he didn't bother with amps after he got shocked <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, you're laughing because you know right i guess if you don't drain them off enough in the right spots or something I mean, uh, I, you know it's <laughs> I, i've been bit in my my you know you don't think about it you're working so much and stuff and st dude i've had ones that just it like shoots you back and afterwards you're just like duh, 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 you know the adrenaline's <laughs> pumping you're like i almost died you're shaking <laughs> for a day or two that's when you get on the guitar so you got your own little vibrato going <laughs> yeah that happens and you're like i think i'm done for the day i'm gonna go home <laughs> <laughs> so we're, now let's reiterate where people can get a hold of you. Where's the best place to get a hold of you on Facebook, Instagram, website? If they want to get a hold of me, I mean, the best thing to do is go to the website, signwaveamps.com and find my phone number. Give me a call or go to the Instagram page, find my phone number. Give me a call. Um, that's the best way. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, I've got a lot of international customers that that doesn't really work for. I mean, surprisingly enough, I, I mean, I half my business goes overseas. Really? Inter like what What area are you talking? Europe, Japan? I, 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 China, Brazil? Japan, uh, Australia, South Africa, the EU. Wow. Um, all over the place. I mean, it was actually really surprising during COVID, Chinese sales went through the roof. I mean, I was building almost... <laughs> They kind of kept me going because, as you know, like the local market died. Um, Flatline. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, um, so, yeah, the best way to do it is like contact me. I mean, I have guys that I talked through on Messenger, Facebook Messenger, um, just because it's got such a good algorithm that I can actually record videos and it'll play the whole thing and it doesn't mm -hmm. suck. <laughs> um, Instagram's not too bad, as you know. I mean, its compression rates aren't too bad, um, which brings up an interesting thing. You know, like sales-wise, the advent of phones and you know, it has it's really easy to sell stuff because people are so used to being able to tell what things sound like on their phones and their devices. That whereas before you'd have to go, you know, you brought up the mom and pop stores. They're not, they're dying breed. They're, they're few and far between anymore. We have a bunch in Tulsa. So we've got 
four of them right now, like good ones. So we got Drew Wind, which got broken into the other night. So everybody get on my Facebook page. And um, he got two guys went in at night. He's got camera footage, but they can't tell who it is. And they stole, like, Gibsons, and all the numbers are put out there by Drew. And yeah. for Guitar House of Tulsa, man, you're talking, like, $28,000 Gibsons and $17,000 stuff. And it was crazy. But we've got, like, That's Guitar House of Tulsa, Barnett Music, we've got Fiery Brothers, and a new one just opened up from Tulsa Band. It's all guitar stuff. I think it's Guitar Exchange, it's called. So, like, just in little 1.3 million people in this whole area, you know, we've got, crazy like, crazy how there's little pockets of that. Because, like, if you look at where I'm at. Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> and tell everybody kind of what, what region you're in, like exactly. Sorry, so I'm about 45 minutes north of San Francisco, um, California, Northern California. I mean, how, even in San Francisco. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, heck? if I was like ever going to put my amps in like dealers or have a dealer, I wouldn't even know where to look in California. I mean, there's, you know, I shouldn't say that. I mean, maybe down in L.A., but – it's interesting that, you know, the like good boutique, you know, like Chicago music exchange or the places yeah. you just met, I mean, deluxe guitars, there's just a handful of them that unless you get these little mom and pa stores that are holding on that can make, I, I don't know how they make it work anymore. To be honest, it's with you. really interesting because that's a discussion, man, that I'm, uh, I want to delve into with some of these guys and get together with them some of the owners, you know, and do like a whole um, series on the relevance of guitar stores, you know, in the modern era. Yeah. So, a little round table on that. It's interesting because yeah. I, I mean, know. it's so easy. Like why would I go down to a guitar store and say I needed an interface and it was $300 at the store, but I can get it for $200 on Amazon. Right. I mean, it sucks. Like, I think a lot of people still will go like, you know what, I'll go spend a little extra money and support the local guy. Right. But if you're a struggling musician or something like that, you're going to go to Amazon. Right. I mean, there's and, always the, you know, we go through and we rummage through like Drew's place and Barnett where we rummage through stuff, you know, even the new stuff. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. I mean, you feel the new stuff like. Yeah. 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 Nags guitars and, you know, and all them guys like that, that you can actually feel it. But, you know. But I get you when it comes to components and a lot of a lot of buyers out there, you know, they don't really care. They'll just go Sweetwater or the guys get beat up in the guitar stores. So they the people walk in with their phone and go, well, I, they're, want, this. They're, I want this. But Sweetwater's offering it for twelve ninety nine. You're selling it for fifteen hundred. Yeah. You know, and they get beat up by <laughs> it's like, oh, God, like, you know, so it's a good question. But amps, you know, I mean, um, I think that's the age as, we, as we're finishing up here. There's the age old question, which I know your answer is, you know, which, if you had to choose between a better guitar or a better amp at a gig, you know, what are you going to go with? Right. So, and it seems to be as I'm doing a lot of interviews, there's, you know, there was a kind of 50 50 for a while, but it seems like more are going towards the amp side of it because you could get a Squire, like I've got $150 Squire, and if I'm playing decent, I'm playing through. If, it, if, the, if the guitar plays well exactly. and it's set up and works and it's intonated. <laughs> you need an amp. <laughs> you need an amp. And, you know, a, a four or $5,000 PRS or like is going to sound exactly the same <laughs> in a bunch of crappy amps. Right. It's not gonna be as that. $150 guitar. It's not going to sound any different, but you get a good amp. Now all of a sudden you're like, Oh, now I can start to hear the difference in pickups and the resonance properties. And it's like, okay, I, it's, it's, I, mean, I know where you're going. Cause you're an amp guy. So of course you, you, you've got to say amp, but I do believe you actually believe it too. You're not just saying, I, it I do. I, yeah. I don't yeah. think that as long as that guitar can play well, you need a good amp. You got to have that facility to get the sound out. And yep. I've noticed it through years. I've played in soup kitchens and, and you know, churches with 6,000 seats in it and stuff here and stuff and in-ear monitors and whatever and played out at different places. And, man, I got to tell you, man, like the PA systems that you're using make a heck of a difference. There's a place in town, I won't mention it, like everybody hates their PA stuff, but they've got a lot of live music and a lot of people show up. So all the artists are like, oh, man, I wish they would just buy a better 
PA, right. you know what I mean? Because it just kills all that work. You just, like you said, you put all that work into buying all the stuff and getting all the pedals and all your sound, and then all of a sudden, you know, the, the PA and just drops. And you've got all. a good sound guy too. Oh yeah, right. There, there's a whole nother. <laughs> there's a whole nother series, man. It's like another. I was talking about the bane of my existence on YouTube is lighting. Well, the bane of like playing out is sound Everybody. guys. Oh man, I remember playing some shows where I'm just playing away, and I got friends show up. This is back like 2008, 2009, 2010, before I gave up guitar for a long time. But um, I was playing that, and I got friends showing up to hear me. You know, and no, we, they can't hear you. They didn't even hear me at all. Like, and it turned out like I had in-ear monitors for that particular venue because it was a big venue, and I was so mad. I mean, I was like, I ain't playing with these people anymore. And then I realized it ain't the band. It ain't the band leader's fault. It's it's the sound guy. Like, you know, he's got his coffee. You know, pretending yeah. to do the fader. He's like, you know, yeah, oh, producer you need, switch. You need it up, yeah. The producer, yeah, like, yeah. Here you go. It's like, <laughs> it's in hey, my you ear. What though? You you probably looked good though. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I was just the rhythm guy anyways, but you know what I mean? But still, you know, we had a, we had a full band and I'm just laughing, but you're right. The, the sound guys are, if places around here and anywhere had decent sound anywhere. guys, if they just paid somebody a little bit or something, but I don't know, that's a whole nother ball game, man. Yeah. And I got friends in Nashville cutting their teeth, some young guitarists living it out there in Nashville. And they have a lot of music stores and a lot of venues and um, some of the hotels that you go to will have two hour long. You just come in and they just get these kids in these, these singers, yeah. guitar players playing 10 minutes. You get two songs and you get up there and you plug in and they actually will have a good sound guy there at some of the hotels. Yeah. And like, so a lot of my friends, these young guys, 20, 24 year old guys, young guys, they'll go into some of these hotels because they have a guy who's working the sound, man. He's like, as soon as you start playing, they start tweaking it for you. And they're yep. like, I got hired, like, I had so many times where I would go to gigs, uh -huh. not me playing, but listening, and I'd have the people that knew me and knew me in the industry, and they'd go, will you go to the soundboard? <laughs> yeah, I've done that, because <laughs> I do sound at churches and stuff, and I've been at, uh, like, the colony one night, and the owner, she was leaving early, and she's like, hey, Max, she's like, here, I'm going to show you how to run the sound for these guys coming in, because I was recording uh, yeah. Shabon, Shabon Tiger is a great player. A good episode. Shabon Tiger, Mike Sadawaki, okay. Native American guys. They're amazing out here. And they play, they play a lot at the colony with Seth and Paul and all them. Anyways, and one night she's like, show me like, push this button, do this. Hit. I'm like, all right, you got it. You know, that way when the, right. when they came in, I'm like, yeah, I'll help you out. You know, <laughs> so, you know, cause otherwise like they don't know if the vocals are too loud or, you know, whatever, you know, any hoot. So it's all about sound, right brother? It is all about, all this is about sound and the love of music and creativity. creativity. I yep. knew you were going to say it. I knew it, buddy. All right. Yep. Well, um, stay on the line here as we wrap up. If anybody's got any questions for you, Chad, if they leave any comments, I'll make sure to forward it to you. And uh, feel anybody out there Absolutely. listening, feel free to just, you know, contact me and to get a hold of Chad. It doesn't matter. We'll, we'll just, Thanks we'll for just, having me on. Yeah, no problem, brothers. Anybody you want to give a shout out to? Uh, while I well, close you know, up here? I'll give a shout out to Brandon. You know, for hooking us up and uh, him being a, a main guy back in that neck of your woods that uh, he's pushing the sine wave brand. Oh man, and he's playing out. You know, with uh, oh my gosh, with so many bands now and stuff. Some newer ones. He was in Oklahoma City the other night taking your amp. He's and, uh, and I was also talking to a guy named Adam Miller out in Australia. He uses, Adam. Yeah, yeah, he uses two rocks. So I've been trying to, he might be on the show soon. And I was talking, Adam and I, I was, I, I was Adam and I were good. Yeah. We're, I've known Adam for a long, long time. And He's a he great is a player, exceptional player, even better guy. Oh, you, that's, that's even the way to go. That's my kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Let me get back out here. Yeah, it's like that's always the best, man, when you meet people who are, are great at their job, but they're amazing people. And so that's been a blessing here, you know, with the channel and everything, meeting all you guys and stuff. So stay on the line. I just want to say thank you to everybody for uh, tuning in today. Please hit the subscribe button, click the bell, and uh, we really appreciate it. Right, brother? <laughs>